We didn't find out till we, we landed back at Masira, just as we, the, the, we, we were found out. The mission's been canceled and the, that we lost eight guys. And uh, it was devastating. So we, you know, licked our wounds, got, got, uh, got everybody taken care of that we could, had a, uh, uh, got everybody together, had a roll call, identified officially who, who, was, who was missing from our uh, Air Force crews, and, uh, and then uh, started packing up and getting ready to come home. You are about to embark upon the Great Crusade to meet this mounting aggression. And make no mistake about it, good will prevail. In 1979, 52 American diplomats and civilians were taken hostage at the U.S. Embassy in Tehran. The Iranian Revolution had led to an international crisis. On February 24, 1980, a daring yet risky rescue mission was launched, dubbed Operation Eagle Claw. Led by CIA and Special Operations Forces, under cover of darkness, their mission was to secure a salt flat airstrip behind enemy lines, Desert One. Co-piloting the lead MC-130E Combat Talon was then-Captain George Furkies. Eagle Claw and its lessons learned led to the creation of United States Special Operations Command, SOCOM. This is Colonel Furkey's story as a Special Operations pilot, from Vietnam to Eagle Claw and beyond. I was born in a little town in, in Indiana called Noblesville, Indiana, just north of Indianapolis. Did you have an interest in flying as a kid? No, not really. Surprisingly, it was one of those things where uh, the opportunity came along. It looked exciting and uh, something, uh, you know, I was going to look like I was going to get drafted anyway. So I volunteered to uh, uh, become an Air Force officer and, uh, and uh, go to flight school. Tell me about flight school. Uh, <laughs> it was... Uh, it was a, a unique experience. I think anybody that has uh, been through, whether Air Force Flight School or Naval Flight School, will tell you it. Uh, it changed your life. I mean, it, uh, as a student, you know, you're uh, some people are, are already attuned to flying. I hadn't done much flying at all, and so it uh, really is a whole new perspective. Uh, you know, you're doing things that you never thought you would do. Uh, you're faced with challenges on, uh, you know. A t First thing, attaining your, your going solo in the in the different airplanes, and the, that's a huge step to all of a sudden be given, especially as you get towards the end, and given this uh, high-powered jet aircraft to go out and do uh, all kinds of acrobatics and maneuvers, and uh, there's there's nobody there but you, and then you're at you know 30,000 feet, and you're free as a bird. <laughs> So you did that in 1969, correct? Uh, 69 and 70. I, gr I graduated in April 70. And so that, of course, is still while the Vietnam War is going on. So, oh, yeah. So yeah. what happened after you finished flight training? So every, once you finish flight training, they, the, the students in the, in the class are um, you know, basically uh, rated, you know, one through the, the, the end of the class. And the first one gets, there's a, a block of airplanes that come down, and everybody gets to choose in, in, in the rating. And, and uh, there was some, some selection uh, also by the instructor pilots, but, but uh, that's where you ended up with the airplane that, uh, you go, uh, that you got. And I ended up with a uh, O2A Super Skymaster, which was a forward air controller. There was about six of them in the class. And uh, we all went, obviously, go right, go right to, uh, well, not right to Vietnam. We did uh, uh, both uh, general uh, survival training, and then uh, we went through jungle survival training on the way to uh, Southeast Asia. And then... Then in, in route, we learned to fly the, the O2A here at uh, Fort Walton Beach at Hobart. And uh, then we got over there and we were assigned to a location in uh, either uh, Southeast or someplace in Southeast Asia, either Vietnam or uh, some of them were over in uh, Thailand. Explain what a forward air controller does. Well, basically, back in those days, uh, we didn't have all the high end communications with the ground troops. So we were the we were the uh, communications link between the fighters and the, and the ground troops. Our job was visual reconnaissance, uh, close air support, uh, battle damage assessment, uh, uh, you know, anything. We had an area, and we were basically responsible for all the activities that were going on it. When, uh, uh, and we stayed in contact with the troops that were on the ground in the movement. Uh, so we were the link. Uh, if they wanted uh, close air support or artillery, uh, and they couldn't reach them uh, with with their uh, radios. We were overhead, and, and that's what we did day in, day out, at night. Uh, 
that was the in-country mission where we had troops on the ground. The, out, the facts at the out-country were flying over the Ho Chi Minh Trail day and night and uh, doing interdiction mainly uh, of the, the convoys coming down. So it was a sort of a different kind if you were in-country or out-country. Tell me a little bit about the O2A. What would you like about it? What was tough about it? <laughs> well, it's a push-pull airplane. It's got, it's got a twin boom. It's uh, fairly maneuverable. Uh, it's not real fast. It uh, doesn't have a lot of armament. Uh, it carries uh, two, two uh, pods of rockets, uh, seven on each side, and also has a station where you can carry uh, uh, flares or other things like that. And uh, There's no guns. The only gun was what we shot out the window if we decided we wanted to shoot our AR-15 out the window. Um, and uh, it's pretty slow. I mean, you know, 130, 140. Um, and it was a good observation. It had very good observation. The windows came all the way down to about your uh, below your waist, so you could see out of it. Uh, it was twin seats, and actually it was a third seat in the back of it. Uh, we had five radios in it, um, but it wasn't air refuelable, so our missions were about, a <clears throat> long mission was four and a half hours. You were on, you were on fumes by the time you did it there, but uh, most of our missions ran two and a half to three hours. Two of the major operations you were connect, connected with, Dewey Canyon 2 and uh, support of uh, Fire Support Base Fuller. So tell me a little bit about those operations. Well, uh, Dewey Canyon 2 was also known as Lomson 719, and it was uh, in early 1970. Uh, <clears throat> there was a decision made for the South Vietnamese to make, make an incursion into Laos and cut the, the Ho Chi Minh Trail at a town called Chapon. <clears throat> Chapon was highly uh, defended by the North Vietnamese. Uh, the plans were made in secret. Um, they were going to supply five, five divisions. They had an armor division, an infantry division, a paratroop division, a marine division, and if there was one other division, and, and they reopened Quezon to do that. The, all the airlift uh, for the insertions were done by uh, U.S. Army helicopters, which all came from basically the northern part of uh, South Vietnam. And we reopened Quezon, and that's where they did the transload to it and put them into all these different uh, fire support bases that they reopened or made during that time. Uh, we went from having 402s and 40V10s at uh, Quang Tri, where I was stationed, to having 40 of each. So it was an unbelievable uh, large exercise. We provided all the day and night uh, uh, air, air cover as uh, forward air controllers and, and uh, generally uh, directed all the airstrikes that, that came in. It was unfortunately not very successful. They did reach Chapone, but turned back immediately. The casualties for the South Vietnamese, South Vietnamese were, were tremendous. Most of those uh, divisions never came back in any more than in pieces and parts. Uh, it was a huge defeat, although they claimed it victory, and that was sort of the beginning of the end uh, that, for the uh, that that era. Uh, for fire support base Fuller was uh, again uh, the by that time the South Vietnamese Army was Second uh, Regiment First Armored Division owned the the DMZ. They took over from Marines there, and so we were their forward air controllers, and they and we worked with the either uh, U.S. Special Forces. U.S. Marine advisors or the Australian Army advisors, which are the Australian, uh, let's see, what AATTV, Australian Army Tactical Training Team, Vietnam, and actually I'm still in contact with one of those guys. But uh, the base, uh, the fire support base, base uh, was getting overrun. Um, we were we were uh, covering it night and day. Uh, there was a, a, a special forces advisor with them and. Uh, we ended up uh, talking to him quite a bit. We put in, I think, the uh, that for that siege over three days. I, I myself put in 40, 43 air airstrikes, one day 23, and, uh, and that was the day we finally broke the the assault on it. And uh, so they did. They got pushed off of it, and then they reclaimed it at the end. But it was probably one of the the more fierce. Uh, uh, firefights and um, you know things, but it was at the end of the war. It was that was April of of May of uh, 
70, so the war was coming to a close. But uh, it was, uh, it was, you know, they wanted they wanted to push down on the DMZ, and in 71, 72, they did. They came right across the DMZ. So that was one of the first probes down there, and it, it was a, it was a fierce battle. They put brigade after brigade and battalion after battalion uh, into that uh, uh, overrun that fire base, and and unfortunately we uh, we lost a lot of South Vietnamese. We lost a couple of advisors uh, during that uh, that siege. What's it like to be in the middle of that? It was uh, crazy. I mean, it was uh, it was uh, tense. It was uh, you know, it, it was one of those things where there was where it wasn't a, a moment where you didn't know that there was you needed to be there. I mean, we we were put in continuous airstrikes, uh, uh, army helicopter gunships, uh, artillery. It was nonstop. Uh, uh, activity and uh, and that whole time the the North Vietnamese were were pouring across the DMZ and they set up uh, 51 cal uh, guns all around the base and uh, trying to shoot down the helicopters and the and the forward air controllers and the and the fighters and uh, and I'm talking to the to the uh, special forces uh, captain that I was talking with and he's whispering because he's hunkered down in a in a, in a tunnel or a, a just a part of the, the fire support base that's still there with what's left of the uh, South Vietnamese. It was pretty tense. Uh, fortunately, uh, he survived and a number of the South Vietnamese did, but uh, there were casualty, large casualties on both sides. The captain uh, who was down there was, uh, was put in for a Silver Star. Uh, I knew him very well, uh, Dave Dickinson. And, uh, and uh, he, in turn, uh, submitted me for a Silver Star. I, it, it was just, that wasn't, I mean, you know, you don't go out to earn that stuff. It, it, you Right place, right time, and doing the right thing. You know, after Vietnam, it was about the time I got back here, you know, it was starting to roll down. And uh, uh, I did a little bit of flying at uh, Tinker Air Force Base. I was flying T T-29s and T-39s, supporting the uh, maintenance teams that came out of there to the different bases around the uh, the, the U.S. for about three years doing that, and then the la the next three years, since the Air Force was drawing down, I got I was assigned to the Rated Supplement. So for two of those three years, I was in the Rated Supplement. I was a Headquarters Squadron Section Commander. Learned all about taking care of the young troops and, and what first sergeants do to make the, the commander's job easier. And it uh, it taught me a lot about uh, command and uh, and discipline and uh, you know, taking care of the young troops and what, what works and what doesn't work. And uh, fortunately, I had a, a chief who was uh, my first sergeant, and he taught me a lot about uh, how to manage on and, uh, and, and command and lead. And so I did that for two years. And then the last year, I was uh, the aide to the two-star at, uh, at Tinker. Uh, and uh, from there, I went on to, to combat talents and at uh, Herbert Field. Fantastic. Well, the American hostages were taken on November 4th, 1979, and from what I've read, planning for a rescue started just a couple days later. So at what point did you start hearing about plans for a mission? Well, you know, we, it, uh, it bubbled up a little bit around the squadron that, you know, something was going on, and, and obviously they didn't just open the doors to everybody right away. Uh, the, the, the senior leadership in the squadron was sort of huddled up, you know, what are we going to do? What do they want us to do? Because I don't think they knew at that time exactly what, what uh, the deal would do. But we had, uh, you know, stateside, we were the only special operation C-130 uh, uh, squadron in the, in the uh, stateside. We did have a squadron of gunships, but uh, for uh, infiltration, exfiltration, we were the only one. So. Uh, we got initially tapped to do that. We started out with uh, just our senior senior crew guys uh, uh, figuring out what we're going to do, and they're sitting behind closed doors. And, and obviously, it was going to be more than just a, a few of the senior instructors and evaluators. So uh, they started forming forming crews. Uh, we ended up with, uh, I think, three crews. Uh, pull-up crews and some spares and, and some other special things that we were doing. So about three two-thirds of the squadron was involved, but it was all very, very, uh, uh, kept very, very uh, close hold. I mean, it was like you can't say a thing. When the, when the boss brings you in and closes the door and said, I'm going to bring you on board, but here's the deal. Don't ask questions. You know, 
when you when you're told to do something, go do it. And that's when we got uh, got uh, acquainted with the uh, night vision goggles. And uh, but it was a it was a uh, a selection basically a selection process of of who wanted to, who was ready to. I mean, obviously, some of us had been, uh, we had some gunship guys that had been uh, flying the AC-130 gunships in Vietnam. We had, uh, you know, a mishmash, almost all the 130 guys in, had had been in Vietnam. I mean, it was, you know, only six or seven years since then that uh, we'd quit flying over there. So it was a fairly experienced uh, bunch of guys, but slowly we built the crews, who was going to be on what. And, and actually that even changed. You know, I started on one crew and ended up as the co-pilot on the, on, on the, uh, um, on the your first airplane, only by, you know, that's just the way the, the cards fell. George, this was, I've called it a daring mission. There were so many different components to it. So uh, ex explain if you can what the design of the plan was. How was it supposed to go? Well, the design of the plan, when we, the final plan, was uh, after many different, uh, what do I say, possibilities, uh, because we had no eyes on the target. We had, uh, you know, we had no no friends in in Iran, so we were there were no friendly airfields to go into, and uh, the distances were huge. Uh, so the the final plan was to do a uh, a. Um, Landing of uh, six airplanes, six C-130s, at a desert landing strip that was not really an airfield, but a, just basically a hard-packed area that had been surveyed by a clandestine uh, um, mission to make sure that it would take the weight of the airplanes and that there was no obstacles in it, and that was known as Desert One. So the, the plan was for the... Uh, six airplanes, three MC-130s, which were special ops airplanes, and three borrowed airplanes that had big cargo compartments but also had air refueling capability, which we needed. They were EC-130s, uh, but they were flown by special ops crews. So we had the, in, uh, in those aircraft, we had the Delta Force was in three of the, they were in the MC-130s, and uh, in the EC-130s, we had the fuel bladders with the, uh, they, we called them FARP, forward air refueling crews. So, and their job was to set up a forward air refueling point for the six, well, actually it was supposed to be eight Navy helicopters flown by a mix of Navy, Air Force, and Marine uh, pilots and crew off a carrier and fly and, and rendezvous at Desert One. The uh, helicopters would be refueled. Uh, the Troops would be cross-loaded to the helicopters. They would take off and go to a hide site for night one. The C-130s, all of us, would depart Desert One and go back to Masira, uh, Oman, and then the uh, night two would start. Some of, some of the night one uh, crews would transition to Egypt and fly night two. So that was that was uh, and that became known as Desert One, and it was a it was like I said it was a a barren piece of ground uh, that had been looked at prior uh, when uh, we uh, th just made the decision to do that. We had, our plan was for for lead airplane, which uh, I was a co-pilot on, would be a good high, uh, hour ahead of the other five airplanes. We would make the approach and land on this uh, desert area, which had been surveyed, and also they had buried some uh, IR lights that could be, uh, I guess you'd say, triggered to pop up out of the ground. And that was the first thing. So we kind of, as we made our, our cross of the, uh, came in, found, found the area. We have very good radar, very good navigators. We, we found the area. So it was a, a moment of, of uh, what well, should I say, uh, you know, what was going to happen. We uh, take out the overhead escape hatch, which you can do on a 130, took out the, the, the antenna to the, the, to the device and flick, hit the switch and the lights came on. So we could see it. We knew there was a box, one, two, three, four, and at the end it was box and one is what we called it. And it was set up. So we knew we, we had the right place. We knew we had a place that, that had been surveyed. So we now we make our, our, our circuit to come back around and land. And it took us 
three more times before we landed because one time we were misaligned, another time there was traffic come down there, came down there. So we'd been across it now three times. And, and, we, and the guys said, we have Delta Force in the back. So they're, they're getting antsy because it was supposed to be only just one time around and land. So we, we landed. And it, when, when we came down, you know, it put down pretty, pretty uh, firmly. And all of a sudden, there's dust everywhere. And, and en route to the Desert One, we had experienced suspended dust in the air. And we went through about two sections of it. And we would, you know, I was sitting as co pilot, and I'm looking out there, ah, it's got dusty, it got real hot. And we're looking around, I'm sort of talking on the intercom on the airplane, and said, what is it? What's going on? And then uh, one of the, uh, actually, it was the guy that put in the, those uh, lights with the, with the uh, clandestinely said, oh, that's a haboob. We're going, what's a haboob? And it's a big cloud of suspended dust. And uh, Is that different from a sandstorm? It's the same as, except it's real, real fine. Okay. I mean, it stays in the air. Sand is, sand is heavier, bigger. It's, it's like talcum powder. It is that fine. So, so we went through two areas of it, and by the time we got to the landing area, it was clear. Little did we know that it was also covered this deep. It's like about five, six inches of it all over, maybe in some places where it drifted a foot or more. So w when we landed the airplane and put it, put the props in reverse to slow down, it just completely covers the airplane in this huge cloud of dust. And we're going, oh, no, you know, we got... And we lowered the ramp and the, the uh, road guards go out, the, 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 the Delta team goes out. And I'm talking on the intercom to the loadmaster in back. He said, you won't believe it. And it's, it is over my boots. I said, what's over your boots? He said, the dust. The dust is over. So that's how deep it was. When we landed, just as we rolled out, a Iranian bus full of tourists comes down the road. And the security guys stopped it. And so we now have 40 Iranians under guard. We aren't sure what we're going to do with them. We've got to work that out. One of the thoughts was we'd take them back with us and then night two take them to the other place and drop them off. But we would have figured it out. <clears throat> so we had them, 40 of them sit there. And so we had a bus and a rogue fuel truck came down the road. And we had road guards out. And he wouldn't, he, you know, they're trying to stop him. He didn't stop, so they, so they launched a law which is a like a ro little rocket blew him up, so now we have a huge fire. So we got a fire, we got a bus, we have the runway set up. We got dust up to our knees, but we're still a go. There's no reason why we can't make this work because the the guys on the truck uh, jumped off the truck and there was a little pickup behind him. It was a big tanker truck and it's burning like crazy. There was a little pickup behind him. They run back to that and off they go and. And the uh, intel guys that were there said, you know, they're probably black market fuel guys. They probably aren't going to go tell anybody. So we'll roll the dice and let that go. We aren't going to go chase them down. We'll probably never find them anyway. So that, that's the scenario. Of, that's the, the, the picture of the, of the uh, Desert One with the fuel truck burning, the two runways set up, the six airplanes on the ground, Waiting for the helicopters to come in, and we also, also with the with the portable nav aid. So uh, helicopters come limping in. They've they've had issues um, holding formation. They're flying a little level. They through the haboob. Uh, they're down to by the time they get there, they're down to six helicopters. We need six to do the mission. Six have to leave the night one desert one before they can uh, uh, continue on the mission. So we get, finally get six down there. By then, says the lead airplane, we left to make room for them. So we had taken off just after I think the sixth airplane got there. And we're out of the way. We're going home and we're, we're comms out. We don't, we aren't, uh, we aren't on the ground. But that started the whole, whole um, uh, process of finding out 
that one of those six helicopters is not flyable. It's got a hydraulic problem. The main hydraulic pump is out, and it's not good to fly with just one, whatever the, the issue was. And I'm not uh, uh, not going to tell the helicopter guys, but, you know, anyway, they made the decision it was not flyable. So now they're down to five, and, and the, the, the ground force says, you know, we, we cannot do this mission with just five. We have to leave here with six. Is there any way you can fix it? Obviously, they went through all the possibilities, etc. The other two, one had stopped and left in the desert on the way because of a bad rotor blade, and one of them had turned back and gone, to, gone back to the carrier because he was disoriented and couldn't couldn't fly anymore. So we, uh, by then, uh, the mission has been scrubbed. A decision was made uh, reluctantly that uh, we're going to have to call it off. So we start to uh, re-transloading re, um, and, and reconfiguring to leave Desert One and uh, moving helicopters around and see where everybody's going to go. And as we were moving one of the helicopters, uh, it lifted off from behind uh, one of the EC-130s that came up, hit the tail, and rolled over on the top of it, and we lost the Three, five guys in the cockpit and three off the helicopter. And that's uh, eight guys that we lost there. And uh, we were airborne during that time frame and uh, we were we were communications out. We didn't, we weren't talking to them. Well, we really, we being uh, the first airplane, we didn't find out until we, we landed back at Masira, just as we, like, there, we, we were found out the mission's been canceled and the, that we lost eight guys. And uh, it was devastating. We, uh, so we, you know, got off the airplane, waited for the other guys to come back. There were casualties. Uh, by then, the, the, the whole process uh, uh, started. We got uh, AeroVac uh, 141s in there to, to uh, take care of the, the burnt guy, guys that had burns on them and, and, and uh, get the, uh, the Delta Force out of there. And it was, you know, didn't just, you, didn't, you don't just stop and just uh, quit. You got to finish it. So we, you know, licked our wounds, got got uh, got everybody taken care of that we could. Had a uh, got everybody together. Had a roll call. Uh, identified officially who who was who was missing from our uh, Air Force crews, and uh, and then. Uh, Started packing up and getting ready to come home. And that was that was it. That was the mission it was scrubbed, obviously. George, I can see the emotion still on your face and in your voice as you discuss that. Uh, I, I want to bring up a couple of reactions uh, to the mission. One of which I know you know about, and one you probably don't, but you might. Uh, first of all, tell us about the message and the gift you got from British commandos. Oh uh, yes. Uh, that's to this day. It's a, uh, I guess, a badge of honor. So we're going through the through the process of of uh, licking our wounds, if you will, uh, you know, trying to figure out what we're going to do, where we're going to go, how you know, starting to uh, get our our gear together and head home. And uh, this little British jeep pulls up beside one of the tents, and when you tent was. Uh, flap was halfway up and you see these two men get out and these two legs come over here and they plop down two cases of didn't know at the time but two cases of cold beer and they get back in their jeep and go they don't say anything and somebody says hey what is, oh we got cold beer and then uh, on the flap of it it says from us all to you all for having the guts to try what a gesture I'm going to tell you one more. Uh, about four years ago, I spoke with one of the Iranian hostages. His name was Kevin Hermaning. He was a young Marine guard at the embassy when it was overrun. And I talked to him around the 40th anniversary of him and the others being taken hostage. And as we got towards the end of the conversation, I asked him what it was like to come home to this rapturous welcome from the American people. And when I asked him about that, he said, as nice as that was, it was the men on Eagle Claw who were the ones who deserved it the most. And here's what he said. It's the three Marines and the five airmen who gave their lives selflessly so that we might be freed. 
just the very idea that people will step up to volunteer to rescue people they don't know because they consider it their duty and their responsibility and they love their fellow man is something that has stayed with me for 40 years. What do you think of when you hear that kind of appreciation? Well, you know, I have, I have met Kevin on a number of, of uh, occasions. We've had him down here as a speaker at our uh, memorial dinner and uh, he is, he is a, a super dude, he's a super troop. Uh, he supports us, continues to this day, and, uh, and those, those words obviously mean a lot to me and to, to all of us that are involved. So how do you go on, not only from the fact that the mission had to be called off, but that you lost those eight personnel? Well, <clears throat> you know, you're, you sort of get back into the, the mode that, you know, you were taught to do. You go back and, you know, you know you got to get the airplanes home, you got to get back to your families. You have, uh, you got to take care of those other families, got to bury your buddies. And then, you know, the, what, what's next? And if there was something next, you know, we uh, said, you know, we're going to, going to do, uh, continue to uh, perfect this, you know, try to, try to get them home. So we had, uh, called it Operation Honey Badger. And the, the armada was huge. But we were still involved. We were still the lead MC 130s. We're leading the way in uh, some kind of a seizure, and it was now the now the whole nation is going. Oh my goodness! You know why didn't we have this? Why didn't we have that? And and uh, you know the Defense Department's going. You know you, what all do you want? Uh, the, why, why didn't we get to have this in beforehand? And you know they stood up the Army uh, Special Ops Aviation and. Um, the whole deal with, you know, lots of, and then we had the Holloway Commission that uh, examined it in, uh, in detail. Uh, we all got to, you know, say, say a few things to that. Most of that was pretty straightforward. Uh, if you read it, you'll, they had a few, few conclusions, most of which I agreed with. Uh, some, you know, they were, I think, political, but, uh, the, uh, but it changed, it changed how we, <clears throat> how the, um, U.S. De Defense's department is, is organized. It, it started the Joint Special Operations Command. It, it, it's, it uh, set up the Army, Navy, and Air Force Special Operations Commands and the United States Special Operations Command down in Tampa. All that was a, was a, <coughs> excuse me, a result of, of uh, the uh, Eagle Claw Desert One uh, mission failure. You know, and, and then the follow-on to that is that, that you know, we lost, lost the eight guys and there were 17 kids left behind. And we said we're going to take care of them. And we've done, done that and more with the Special Ops Warrior Foundation. You know, we're up to, uh, we put over 500, around 500 kids through college. We've got a thousand waiting we're, and every one of them is going to be wherever they want to go to school. We've got to pay for everything. We pay for, for tutoring. We pay for preschool. We pay, I mean, it, the, 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 Joint, the, the Special Operations Warrior Foundation is just a continuation of that, that let's get it done. We have a way today this, we can take care of this, we can, we can make it happen.